Hey everyone, welcome in to a, another daily editorial here on the KE Report. I'm getting an update from Graphene Manufacturing Group, traded on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol GMG. Also traded now on the OTCQX under the symbol GMGMF. I am chatting with Craig Nickel, founder and CEO of GMG. Now, Craig, there's been a, quite a bit of news that has come out of the company over the last month. We can talk everything about cost reductions from an operational level, also the start of trading on the QX, as well as the company's battery division making it to a thousand milliamp capacity. All of this released pretty much in the last month, but I do have to ask you, Craig, because I have gotten a number of questions, is that recently, just over the last about week and a half, the stock has sold off a fair bit on the back of, again, not much news. So do you have any insights for shareholders here about what's causing this sell-off in the shares? Yeah, thanks, Corey, and I appreciate you having me back on again. Uh, yeah, look, it's it's an interesting one. I can tell you um, we're fully disclosed and... We've got a, um, I get anecdotal evidence to say that shorts are, are, are on the stock. Uh, it's, it's very hard to know exactly what the shorts are doing and, and how much they are and what the impact are because there's, if you don't know, there's very little data that the exchange uh, provides, um, nor um, OTC and TSXV. So to actually understand um, the impact, it's, it's quite difficult, especially intraday shorts, kind of more longer term shorts, you, you, there is some data. Um, it comes a bit about every, um, every few days, it's not daily. So yeah, it's, it is difficult to know exactly, but I do, I do think there's some element of it that it's working through you know, th those shorts. And, and I guess I hear a lot of different people who, who follow our stock quite well in quite detail say, say that it is. So that's, that's pretty much all I have to say at this point. Okay. Well, Craig, I'm sure I'll keep getting emails and questions about the share price. I'll keep watching along. Let's talk about the company then. The most recent news release, March 11th, the operational cost reduction, a target of $4.5 million Australian. How should investors view this? What are you doing to reduce these costs and how does that impact the overall strategy of the company? Yeah, so we, we've done this because we're merging into or becoming into a, a, a commercial operation and it's really important to have your cost targets very clear. So when you start um, uh, coming out with you know, your profitability targets and your, and your understanding around your, um, your look forward potential cash flow positive uh, space, that, that we have all of this clear. Um, so we put this target out. We believe that, you know, probably probably around half of it will be achieved through organisational changes that we've already implemented. Now, those organisational changes come about from us going through a very large engineering projects phase uh, that probably for the last two years we've had both a team in operations and a team in projects and now we've basically finished that work for for the, the near future. We've taken an opportunity to reset and we've we pretty much merged those teams in, in effect. We brought a new person in charge of our development operations. He's been with the company for more than a year and has been doing a great job in his existing role. So we brought him across to be the chief development and HSC officer. That's um, Paul McIntosh. And then we effectively then get um, a lot of those cost savings through the blending of putting a, a projects and operations team back together um, because we just don't have the, the work for the engineers um, at this point. Now, of course, we've got work coming up, um, which we can talk about, the development work, but that's not until uh, for some time, and we want to make sure that we have the business set correctly with the right people, the right team, and have um, the right cost base, and that's effectively what this is about. So, Craig, is this slowing down any of the growth or advancements in any of the divisions? I, I would suggest no, it's not. Um, we haven't. In fact, we've been trying to um, increase the speed of those areas. We haven't really had any significant impact on the battery team, nor have we had any uh, change in the sales area. So, you know, my feeling is that we'll have a pretty, uh, we'll still be pushing through all of those areas as as we've been 
in the past and will continue, and I believe we continue to do that. So, no, it should not change our impact in, or our delivery in those really important areas. And we'll be highlighting and very focused on um, delivery even more with um, very, very targeted applications of people to, to, to deliveries as we've done in the past. But it'll be even more heightened with a very keen focus on delivery under this new cost mindset as well. Okay, so let's break it down by division, starting with the battery division. February 6th, you announced that the graphene aluminum ion battery got to 1,000 milliamp capacity. February 14th, you released some temperature data around the charging capability of this battery. What comes next for the battery? Where do we stand in terms of growing this division? Yeah, so the, the test what we're doing next is it's to basically get to... A, a fully tested, third-party tested battery. And that's what we have to do for the Rio Tinto Joint Development Agreement and also for customers who, you know, potential customers who, who want to see it and test it as well who are around the world. So that's that next phase. You know, we, we continue to see strong interest in this battery from a number of different types of sectors and, and, and types and, and customers, potential customers around the world. That's still there. It is revolutionary in multiple aspects. You know, obviously, no lithium, no copper, very, very fast charging and discharging, which is really quite uh, unique. It's probably the most unique battery of its type. And obviously, you know, made of al aluminum or uh, aluminium, depends on where you're, yeah, which side of the Pacific you're on. Uh, and then, you know, it's uh, obviously got uh, some obviously really good uh, uh, recycling and life opportunities um, uh, 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 parameters as well. So that it's the, the next stage is, is get the, the battery externally tested, get it. We're obviously doing work internally to be able to do that because uh, there's a number of batteries that we've got to provide to different companies around the world to do that. And we're working through those internal tests and doing it ourselves. And when you do that, you find things and you fix them up and then you do them again. Uh, so once you get that to a point that you think you, you've got it and you send it externally, and then we'd be announcing those results um, pretty quickly thereafter by the companies that, that have done it all. If we can't name them, we'll, we'll hopefully be able to share the results. So is that a this year type of thing then? Will there be enough batteries produced to send out to people to test them to get back that data this year? Yeah, definitely. So that's definitely this year and we're hoping in the very near term. Um, we've really we've, we've been saying uh, you know, for some time that we aim to have all this done by the by basically June this year. So we've got another three and a half months or so to, to hit that target. Uh, we think we'll get there. Uh, we've just had um, Bob Galgan, a director um, based in Indiana, come across it to Brisbane to review our battery team's progress last week. It's always great when he comes across. He's come up a number of times and. You know, of course, when you've got one of the most um, knowledgeable guys in the world in, about batteries, um, he's probably built uh, factories and made more batteries than probably any other person in the world in terms of lead acid and lithium iron as the previous CTO for CATL. So he, he's got uh, uh, you know, a lot of experience to be able to help us guide this brand new technology into in getting it into the world. So, you know, feel confident that that with his uh, support and plus also numerous other different advisors' supports that will we'll push this through. So when it comes to some of this recent battery data as well, what's the difference here between the coin cells and the pouch cells that the company is delivering? Yeah, so the coin cell data is always good to do and it's very important to, to do that way because you can do lots and lots of tests. You could make a couple hundred coin cells a week with manual testing and do, therefore, you know, great analysis of that outcome and then go from there. When you do pouch cells, what you're doing is you're scaling the reaction inside the, 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 the across the cell. And what that means is you're testing its ability to transfer into, into a larger surface area. Now, very few companies have actually got from coin cell to 1,000 milliamp hours, which I've been told by Bob, very few companies, and we're one of the few. So to get here is already a massive achievement. Nothing that shareholders, I'm sure, will say, oh, your job's done. We're nowhere near that. But it is a really big achievement to get here because it means we can scale it 
And what we need to do now do is, as I said, do more testing so that we can furnish our, these cells out to the companies to test it externally. And, and that, that, that'll then make sure that we've got every which way tested for this, for this cell going forward. But generally what happens when you go from coin cell to pouch cell is that the parameters can change. And so that's what we've said a number of times in our press releases. You know, our coin cell data may not necessarily link directly to our pouch cell data. And that's typically about energy density. So our power density is pretty much always there because that's the that's a reaction. That's that's how um, that's how fast we can charge it and discharge it. But the uh, it, it, that's linked to how how low our internal resistance is for the battery, and that's that's there. Energy density is about literally getting materials from existing companies and getting them lightweight enough. And so when you have a coin cell, you you're calculating it off some metrics that you use as an industry standard. But when you go pouch cell, you're actually weighing the materials of what it is off the shelf. So we've got to get materials off the shelf and put them in the pouch cell and then weigh it. And so that material, that energy density for us will only increase over time as we optimise it with different weight and materials that we get off the shelf from different suppliers around the world. And so that's the one that we're going to continue to work through. Now, we haven't published that at all, and I know some people want to know what, what, what the energy density is. We haven't done that yet because we haven't got to a cell which we can absolutely say this is it. Uh, and while the energy density is jumping around, we don't want to say what it is until then. So that's that's where that is. But once we've done all the full testing, we'll then tell you the, what the energy density is, and then we can go from there. Okay, Craig, it sounds like you're getting the same questions as I am then. And can we not then calculate the energy density of this right now? Uh, it just wouldn't mean enough for people to be able to say what it is. It's So it's not what the coin cells were getting at, just to be clear. I think people worked that out. It, but it is nowhere near what it can be looking at the materials. We, we get one material, which is one-tenth the weight of the next material. And so one, one energy density could be X, and then the next material could be, you know, 10 times better. So that's why I don't want to give a number, because there's that cell that we're doing that work on, and, and it does really well, and you say, well, this is, this is the energy density for that cell. You know, we'd repeat that, and then the next week we find a material that's completely different and then we get a different energy density, and it's it's substantially different. So that's why we just said this is a thousand million powers. We've reached that, which is already big. We'll come out with the energy density, and it's going to be a a trajectory. It'll never be, hey, we've just arrived at at the 300 watt hours per kilogram, because it it has to go through the material optimization process. And for lithium ion batteries, that took 40 years uh, to get from you know 90 watt hours per kilogram up to well, eventually it's probably at 250. So it took 40 years to go through that. We won't hopefully take that long, but um, that's it's all about getting materials off the shelf that we can use straight away and being able to get them as lower weight and thinner as possible. Okay. Everyone, keep sending me your questions on that, and I'll try to get Craig to clarify for you. Let's also talk about the Thermal XR division, so TXR. I had a couple of questions asking, what about U.S. approval? Last time I had you on the show, you outlined that that could be coming. We haven't seen any news on it. So any updates here? Yeah, it's, uh, so we, we, we put a, uh, a paragraph into our last press release talking about how we've, we've actually been now informed of that we, it's best not to do a low volume exemption for the EPA. Now, just to be clear, we have our Australian approval for this product and the Canada approval, and many other countries, but those two already. And there are companies who've got graphene approvals at the US EPA. So we're not trying to do something no one's ever done before. And so we've been told that actually not not, not to do a low volume exemption, not to do a low volume uh, amount, which would have been easily still a lot of thermal XR because it's so little graphene in it. Um, but to put in a full proposal, uh, a full application, what's called a pre-manufacture notice, now, um, what that means is, you know, we've got to go through uh, that, that process with, you know, full clarification on all the risks. So we, we kind of thought that that would have been, because uh, it was a full application, it would have been more difficult uh, to get that approved. But apparently that's not the way uh, it's seen by the government. And so we're working through now formulating a strategy 
and an application for, for what's called a full pre-manufacture notice for the EPA. And then once, you know, hopefully that, that goes in, we'll then be able to, um, you know, to, to detail that to people. Um, we'll, make, we'll make another announcement about that. It is kind of counter to what we've seen in other countries. So it's, a, it's, a, it's definitely a learning. Um, and, you know, we've got to work through that with, with the local regulators because every regulation um, and regulator has different uh, laws about how uh, their approvals um, need to be, you know, c- um, complied with. Uh, of course, that's what, and that's what we'll do. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll work through the next stage, forming a strategy with our service providers, and we'll make another announcement about that. Um, but effectively, we've been told make a bigger uh, approval for the graphene into the EPA, and then um, it will be considered uh, as more favourable than what we've done, which is the low volume exemption. So what does this mean for the path to revenue or cash flow, let's say, positive cash flow for the TXR? Any updates that you can give us here, timeline-wise? Yeah, so we're obviously, you know, keen to do the American sales with New Calgon. Um, They're obviously, they're still very, very keen and um, uh, to make this happen, they've just launched the product already in, 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 America. So, you know, I think we'll we'll work through with them on what that means. Um, you know, obviously, we'll be pushing hard to with, with New Calgon as well to put any new application in to go make sure that gets put done as fast as possible. Obviously, that will delay revenues in, in Americas. Um, we are seeing some revenues, um, you know, keep uh, to come up in 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 Asia, and you know, I think we should we should see some um, revenues in Australia as well. You know, looking forward, you know, obviously we've got to got to manage our business with regard to, you know, the the, the cash coming in and and obviously the, the the costs going out, and that's what we we continue to do. So, what about near term news flow then? Corporate wise, what should investors be watching out for? What's going to drive this stock and change the direction? Yeah, so we're we're obviously trying to um, position the company for the next phase of the growth, which is you know my my job is clearly. 6, 12, 18, 20, uh, 24 months out always. And, and that's around attracting uh, government and strategic investment into building the next phase, which is obviously the battery plant, the automatic battery pilot plant, and also the expansion for the graphene production as well, the next phase for that, which uh, are you know, obviously all uh, accelerative and, and developmental. So those, that's, that's something that we're working through. Uh, and you know, as we progress with ThermoXR and you know, and, and sales there will obviously be we'll be making uh, headlines there when we when we progress that as well. And we're still pushing the G lubricant uh, product through a whole lot of testing regimes, um, and we'd dearly love to come out with that as well. Um, battery testing uh, and samples for battery testing, you know, when that comes out, we'll obviously clearly be be telling everybody that as well. All right, Craig, thank you very much for this update. Please, everyone, keep sending me your questions, and I will keep bringing Craig on the show to address all the developments in the three different divisions within GMG. I'll also post a link to the GMG website below. Craig, thank you very much for your time today. I appreciate the update. Thanks, Corey.